Well, I got to say, it's, uh, it's exciting to be in front of people. It's my first time to preach to people in the room in over four months. So, yes. It's good to see all of you. Some of you, today's your first time that you've been back to church, and uh, we, we're just so grateful every week to see new faces and so thankful to be gathered here together. It was intimidating preaching just to a camera, to an empty room, and I got to say, I, I, I feel a little bit, uh, of course, I've done this once already this morning, but uh, just, just being in front of people just kind of gets me a little bit charged. And so excited to bring the word to you today. We are continuing in a red letter series that we started way back at the beginning of the year and we're still continuing. To be honest with you, we could go for two years uh, just looking at the words of Jesus in scripture. So uh, we're called it red letters. And so uh, some of you in your Bibles, and I don't know if you still use this version of the Bible or this version of the Bible, but either way, uh, you probably have a version that has red letters in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the actual words of Jesus. And so we've been looking in this series at the words of Jesus. What does Jesus have to say to us? The reality is uh, what he spoke over 2,000 years ago to the people of his day was very relevant and is still relevant to us today. There are 65,000 words in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the story of the birth, the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus, his ministry here on earth. 65 5,000 words, if you add up all the words of those four Gospels, over half of those are attributed to Jesus. Over half of the words in the New Testament are red letters. So it's worth us looking at what does Jesus have to say to us. Jesus' words, he tells stories, he preaches sermons, he teaches, gives us wisdom to help us to know how best to live our lives today, right here in 2020. It's 2020. This is June 14th. Summer comes this week. And it just seems like a blur over, as I look over the last few months. Uh, but Jesus, his words this morning, I want to look at Luke chapter 6. So if you want to turn in your Bibles there, be ready. We'll, look, we'll be reading the scripture there in just a moment. Many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We find that in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. It begins with Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And here in Luke 6, we have the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain, not the airplane, but the plain, like level ground. And so Luke 6, 17, it says that Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. And here we see Jesus begin to give the sermon on, on the plain, the sermon on the level ground. So before Jesus came down from the mountain, it tells us that if you read earlier, that he was up on the mountain and he spent time there with God praying. He prayed all night long had an all-night prayer meeting on a mountain, and that morning it tells us that out of all of his disciples, he chose 12. After that all-night prayer meeting, chose 12, picked 12 of his disciples that would become apostles, and so then he comes down from the mountain from this experience to this level ground, and he begins to preach uh, to multitudes. Everywhere he went, multitudes gathered, and so they had gathered, it says, in this region, uh, from all of Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the north coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon, they came to hear him. They came to be healed by him because Scripture says that power was coming out from him. And it tells us literally that Jesus healed all of them that were there. He healed them all. So in this sermon, on the Sermon on the Plain, in, uh, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus teaches Beatitudes. He teaches them to love enemies to not judge but forgive others. He talks about the importance of bearing good fruit in our lives as followers of him. And he concludes this teaching with a, the importance of obedience. And so in verses 46 to 49, Jesus rebukes those who claim to be his followers, but don't do what he says. So we're reading in this text, Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 46 through 49. This is what he says, red letters, Jesus's words. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. And when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on top of the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. 
And so Jesus asked this question at the very beginning. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? Why do you say that I'm Lord of your life, but then you don't follow up by doing what I tell you to do? What kind of faith is this? You're calling me Lord. You're saying, I'm the master of your life, yet you don't do what I tell you. So we're talking about the importance of obedience for a follower of Jesus. Someone said, it's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities or the consequences of not doing it. Let me say that again. It's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard or difficult it is, than to face the responsibilities or the consequences of not doing it. To call Jesus Lord means that we've made a commitment to him as the master, as the ruler of our lives. And so I ask you this question this morning. Who's in charge of your life? Who's really in charge of your life? For really real, like who's got control of your life? This, this ugly chair right here, just assume it's a throne. Kind of has this velvety look to it, but it's kind of old. And, but this, this represents your heart. Who sits on the throne of your heart? You see, before Christ came into my life, I was the one sitting in this throne. Before you came to Christ, you were the one sitting on the throne of your life. But when Christ came in, when you give your life to Jesus, something had to change. When you give your life to Jesus, what you do is you get up from the throne and you let him take his rightful place on the throne of your heart. You let him be Lord. You let him be the master. You let him be the one that calls the shots. Let him have authority in your life. Let him decide what it is that you need to do. And his word, Jesus' words, have given us a lot of clarity in what it is that he wants us to do. So who sits on the throne of your heart? Letting him sit on the throne of your heart or, or whatever. It's not a reckless choice of just letting anyone be in charge of your life. Here's the deal. Jesus, God himself, is the creator. He's the engineer, the designer of this life that I, that I live and yours as well. He's the one who's, who, who, who created in the first place. And he's the sustainer. He's the redeemer. He's the healer. He's the comforter. He's all of that, and he's so much more. He's our everything, our all in all. So why would anyone call him Lord, surrender the throne of their heart to him, but refuse to obey what he tells them to do? These things that Jesus taught were, were meant to help people, were meant for his true followers to, to apply them to their lives in order to be fruitful and productive to live godly lives. Some of you will recognize the name Roger Staubach. We're going back a few years. Dallas Cowboy quarterback in the 1970s. Who, who remembers Roger Staubach? Roger Staubach in the 1970s with the Dallas Cowboys won two Super Bowls, Super Bowl VI and Super Bowl XII. His coach, the famous Tom Landry, was a genius at football. And here's the deal, Tom Landry called every play. Roger Staubach knew that Tom Landry was calling every play, and the only time that Roger Staubach could call a play is if there was an emergency in the game. And he trusted him because Tom Landry was such a genius. I mean, they, they had a winning machine. But, but Roger Staubach uh, confessed that there was, uh, there was a time where pride just welled up in him, and he's thinking, I, I'm, I'm the quarterback of this team. I should be able to be in charge. I should be able to call the shots. I'm the one that's on the field. And he said it wasn't until he really um, had, a, had a heart check and faced up to this issue of obedience. He said, once I, once I learned to obey, there was harmony on our team and between coach and myself, and it led us to winning ultimately two Super Bowls. 
The issue that Jesus is addressing in this question to uh, the people that he was speaking to that day and to us is the issue of obedience. He expected it of them, and I believe that today he expects it of you and me as followers of him. James 1.22 says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't merely listen to the word, do what it says. If we're just listening, if we're just hearing and we're not putting it into practice, James says, you're deceiving yourselves. So listen, that's what you're doing today. You're sitting here and you're hearing, right? You're listening. You're listening to me, but hopefully even deeper than that, you're listening to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can say something to you that I don't even know. I don't even know about you. I say, bring God's word. The Holy Spirit does something with that word. And today I hope that he just turns on a light inside of you and and you respond to that and say, look, it's not enough for me just to know this truth. It's not enough for me just to hear this. This requires me to do something. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Just hearing, listening, but then doing. He said, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my words, and puts them into practice. And the picture of what a God-exalting life is supposed to look like, he uses this picture of a man building a house. I know we got some home builders, some people that do this uh, for a living in our church. But he's talking about this thing, this person, this home builder, uh, when they build a home, they dig down deep and they lay a foundation on solid rock. So if we're going to have a strong foundation in our lives, we've got to dig down deep. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the the Tower of Pisa, Leaning Tower of Pisa. you got a picture of it here. You've already got this in your mind. Began construction in the the year 1173, finished construction in 1372. So 199 years of construction to make that building right there. It was delayed many times because of war, because of debt, uh, and because of engineers who had to be called in to figure out how they were going to correct the fact that this thing... Uh, on his foundation was leaning and uh, so they had to do some bring in some engineering so 199 years this thing is 183 feet tall and from top to bottom it's about 15 to 17 feet out of plumb and they figure that every year it had uh, leaned about a 20th of an inch more so every 20 years it was moving an inch and over almost 900 years this is this is what you have From 1990 to 2001, over a decade of reconstruction, they came in and tried to stabilize and reduce the tilt. They reduced it from five and a half degree tilt to a four degree tilt, and they said that they firmed up the foundation enough that it's stable for the next 300 years. But it's still still leaning, all because of a poor foundation, only 10 feet deep into the ground and on poor soil. This is what you get. So a solid foundation, we all understand this, it's crucial to the integrity and the longevity of any building. A good foundation is, is, is integral to a, a, a successful and healthy church, as well as our lives as Christians. We're talking about a solid foundation. I read this week about a, a, a housing development that went in a few years ago in Mesquite, Nevada. This was a a gated retirement community. And so I had a lot of uh, retired people moving into this this neighborhood. And and after just a few months, they began to see large cracks develop in in people's driveways. Large cracks started forming in the streets and people's homes, they started getting cracks in the wall and they started smelling this awful gas, methane gas that was coming up from the ground that almost moved everybody out of the area. And they found out that eight of the homes in this development were built right over a former landfill. A foundation, a solid foundation. If we're gonna have a a strong foundation, then we need to dig down deep and make sure that we're building on solid ground. And this is Jesus talking about our lives in spiritual terms. What does it mean to dig deep and have uh, a good foundation to dig deep is, is to get beyond surface level Christianity. So we're not just attending church, but we're serving other people. We're serving the church. We're not just, ha- we don't just have a faith that says, I believe in God, but it's actions that reflect and demonstrate our faith in God. John said, you talk about faith, or James said, you talk about faith. I'll show you my faith by what I do. 
It's not just reading the Bible, but it's discovering the truth of God's word and then applying it to our lives. If we only hear the word, but we don't do it, James said, we deceive ourselves. It's not just fellowship. It's not just getting together with people, but it's building deep, heartfelt relationships. We're talking about getting down deep and building on a firm foundation. It's not just lip service, but it's true obedience to Jesus as Lord of our lives. So we need to dig deep, have solid ground to make sure that what we're building is going to last. And we ask this question, we're wondering, why would anyone, why would anyone ever build any kind of a building, any kind of a structure without a foundation? That's a good question. Why would they do that? Well, probably to save time, to avoid some work, uh, but it really is short-sightedness. Because without a solid, firm foundation in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship with God, or everything else, your life is going to crumble and fall apart. It's got to have a a good, solid foundation. So everybody in Jesus' audience this day would have understood. Everybody would understand and and think, uh, all of us here understand this, that it would be absurd to build uh, a, a, a structure without a foundation. So lazy that someone would build something without thinking how and where they were going to build this house and what it would need. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about building a stick-built home. He's talking about our lives as followers of him, the kind of foundation that you would build your life on. So what Jesus is asking uh, and saying is is this. There's going to come a time in life where you're going to really struggle. How many of you have been there before? You've been through something that you say, this is... This is a major struggle. Some of you may be going through times like that right now. He said there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to really struggle, when the wind is going to blow against your life, when the rain is going to come down and beat down on your life, when the waves are going to lap against your life, and and everything's going to seem like it's going to fall apart. How you build your foundation and what you build it with is going to make all the difference of whether or not you stand in the midst of those storms. Talking about a a foundation that's going to last. In in 2000, we built a house that we still live in to this day. 20 years ago, it's hard to believe that it's been 20 years. But I remember when we built this house, um, it it took time. It took a lot of time, but it took a lot of time to, to build the foundation. We had to dig down into the soil. And uh, we had to find, you know, a a firm enough place. We had to have inspectors come out and do a a compaction test on the soil to make sure that it was solid enough to hold the foundation. And I'm saying it took a long time. It was a lot of dirty, muddy work, a lot of sweat. And you can't really see any of that. It's underneath the surface. But we we took time to do that uh, so that what we built uh, would, would last. And I'm telling you, I, I had dreams the whole time that we were building this house. And shortly after we moved in, I had dreams because we live on a, on, a, on a walkout lot. And I just had dreams that our house slid off the foundation into the backyard. I had dreams that everything came cr- sinking down and crashing down in the middle. It was terrible. And I realized I'm the one that built this house. And if something like that happens, I got nowhere to go. I, I'm the one that's responsible. But that's really a picture of our lives. You and Jesus are the one building on on your life. And if that thing comes crashing down, you got nowhere to look at but yourself because Jesus has already made a way. It's up to you. What are you going to do? How are you going to build? What are you going to build on? What Jesus is telling us in Luke 6 is, and what I want to get across to you today is this simple fact, and I think you've already figured this out. A, A solid foundation is crucial for the success of your life. Jesus is basically saying there's, there's two foundations. There, there's two foundations that you can build your life on. You can build your life on the teachings of Jesus or anything else. Jesus' teaching, his words in Scripture, is what's going to last. Everything else won't. He's talking about a big picture, being far-sighted not short-sighted, not looking for a quick fix. Jesus said, a wise man, a wise woman is one who comes to me, hears my words, and does them, puts them into practice. Everyone else is like a fool who builds his, builds his house or builds his life right on top of the ground. 
It doesn't make any kind of sense, but that's what people do all the time. Scripture tells us that there's only one true foundation that we can depend on, and Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So without Jesus, you can build, you can build a house, you can build your life, but without Jesus, you won't have a foundation. Does that make sense? He's the solid ground. He's the firm foundation. He is the rock. The Bible talks about him being a cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. It's so many scriptures that refer to Jesus as the rock. And Jesus also says this about himself in John 15, 5. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Apart from me, you can do nothing without the foundation that is already laid that is Jesus Christ, without you being connected to, 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 the, to the vine, you are not going to do anything. Jesus said to the people in John eight thirty one. it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Just a few verses later, Jesus says, um, he says, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're truly free. Jesus prayed this of his disciples in John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the, the truth. And the, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus and his teachings are truth. And anything that contradicts that is false. Let me say that again. Jesus and his teachings are truth. And anything that contradicts that is false. God's word is always right. God's word is always right. I can be wrong. Matter of fact, I find out that I'm wrong a lot. But God's never wrong. So the wise person is the one who hears the words of Jesus, who is truth, who is never wrong. Hear the words, and secondly, not only just hear the words, but does what he asks them to do. The foundation of your life is based on what you decide to do in your life. It's based on you. What do you decide to do? And you can do what you want to do, You've got that choice. You can do whatever you want to do, or you can do what Jesus tells you to do. But that decision is going to determine the foundation that you lay in your life. Does that make sense? He gives you that choice. And so I come back to this question again. Who's in charge of your life? Who's in charge of your life? Who is it that sits on the throne in your heart. Are you surrendered to the king, the one who needs to sit on the throne of your life? Because, you know, he is the one who's got the blueprint for your life. He designed the plan for your life. And only he knows how to really make that happen. You see, he knows everything. He's always right. He's never wrong. He knows everything. I don't really know much at all. His perspective is huge. My perspective goes no further than these walls, really. I just can't see things that he sees and that he already knows. So who's in charge of our lives and who are we letting decide what we do in life? You say, does that really make a difference? Can't I decide what I want to do with my own life? And the answer to that is absolutely, of course. You can make that decision. You can do that on your own. You can make your own decisions. You can call the shots. You can be in charge of your life. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to end disastrously. This is what Scripture says. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man. There's a way, and it seems right, but it says the end leads to death. 
I'm not a huge fan of the message version, but listen to what the message version says in Proverbs 14, 12, and 13. He says, there's a way that of life that looks harmless enough, but look again. It leads straight to hell. There's a way of life that looks harmless enough, but look again, it leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all of that laughter will end in heartbreak. So you can be sure, if you're, if you're on the throne, if you're calling the shots and you're on the throne of your own heart, it's not going to go well for you. Let the one who is the designer, the blueprint maker, the one who has the big purpose, uh, the big perspective, the big plan, let him be in charge uh, directing your life. Our decisions, our perspectives are based on limited understanding, like I said. We don't know everything, but he does. So therefore, we need to listen to Jesus, and we need to do what he says. But I want to close with, with this focus. See, Jesus talks about this wise person who builds us on a solid foundation, and this is what he says. He talks about listening to his words and doing, but what does he say first? This person is one who comes to me, who comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. There's a lot of people out there who believe Jesus was a, a great teacher. There's a lot of religions that believe that Jesus existed and that he was a great teacher. And uh, all you need to do is to read his words and obey what he teaches and everything's just going to be fine. He was that kind of man. But they don't want to come to Jesus. That's the difference. Come to Jesus. They just believe in his teachings and think that's sufficient. But if that's all Christianity is, if Christianity is just a bunch of teaching, a lot of do's and don'ts, then Christianity is no different than any other religion because they're all based on do's and don'ts too. So what other religions teach is that you can do what has to be done, but the Bible says you can't. You can't do what needs to be done. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and all fall short of God's glory. You can't do it yourself. Without Jesus, you and I simply don't have what it takes to do what it takes to do the right things in our lives. That's why Paul wrote, I'm determined in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I'm determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, without Jesus, all we're left with is a moral code, and there's nothing wrong with a moral code. Um, but that leaves us to do everything on our own. And he didn't intend it to be that way. So when the storms come and the, and the rain falls and the floods beat on our lives, we're going to be overwhelmed. Without Jesus, we don't have any real hope of surviving because there's no one else with us. We're just doing it on our own strength. But you see, when Jesus died for us, he was buried in the tomb. And he rose from the dead. He proved that he was capable of overcoming the most threatening storm that we face in our life, which is death. He overcame death. Romans 8, 11 tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me, lives in you. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us. And he has given us that power through his Holy Spirit to be able to live this overcoming life. We have to listen to what he says. We have to do what he says. But the first thing that we need to do is come to him and realize, I can't do it on my own. I don't want to do it on my own because I don't know how to do this. Jesus, you're the one with the word of life. It's Jesus himself that makes all the difference. Last week, if you heard Pastor Zach's message, if you didn't, get online and listen to that. But this was the message. It's just Jesus. And really that message fits with what I'm talking about today. It's just Jesus. We need to come to him. We need to receive him into our lives. And if you haven't received Jesus into your life, if you haven't let him on the throne of your heart, today is the day to do that. All we need to do is come to Jesus and receive Jesus. To receive Jesus, first of all, you've got to believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, all of the world, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Believe that he is the Christ. Repent of your sins. What is repentance? We know that repentance is doing a spiritual about face. It's turning away from our sin and turning toward Christ. Repentance. 
It's a change in the way that we think that leads to a change in the way that we live. When you really change your mind about something, it's going to change the way that you think about it. It's going to change the way that you talk about it, you feel about it, and how you act about it. True repentance is more than just a mental thing of saying, I'm, I'm going to do this instead. Repentance is a decisive change in direction. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of thinking, that leads to a change of attitude, that leads to a change of feeling, that leads to a change of values, and that changes the way you live. Paul said this in Acts 3.19. After the day of Pentecost, he said this. He said, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Believe that God exists, that he is the son of the living God. Repent of your sin and confess Jesus as your Lord and your master. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Who's sitting on the throne of your heart? Today, if you haven't allowed Jesus into your heart, listen, the only thing that you need to do today is let Jesus be on the throne of your heart. With every head bowed and your eyes closed today and you're here today and you said and you will say Jesus is not on the throne of my life I'm really the one calling the shots I'm really the one that's in control and honestly I've made a mess of a lot of things and today you're presented with this case that Jesus Christ is the answer I'm not saying that everything's going to be perfect and hunky-dory in your life but I'm saying that the big picture perspective he died he gave his life so that we could live and all we have to do is let him in and say, Jesus, save me. How many of you today would raise your hand and you say, you know, Pastor Jeff, I'm not, not living for him. He's not on the throne of my heart, but today I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to me that a change needs to take place in my life. Something radical needs to happen, and I need to get off that throne and let Jesus in. And with every head bowed, eye closed, you just raise your hand saying, that's me. I'm inviting Jesus into my life today. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. How many of you say, you know, Pastor Jeff, I feel like I've surrendered my life to Jesus, but I'm guilty of pushing him out or just bringing my stuff and kind of, you know, this, a chair in my bedroom often collects a bunch of junk. Clothes, stuff. But is Jesus on your throne? Have you given him everything? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you something today and you're saying, you know what? I want to live fully. You can have God, have all of me, all of my heart. And today you'd say, he's on the throne, but I really need to give him everything. There's something that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you today and you say by raising your hand, pray for him, Pastor Jeff, that I give him everything. Is that you today? Jesus, we listen we want to hear your voice. May we all tune our hearts, our ears to hear what you're speaking to us. May we be people of your word and people of your spirit to be in a posture to listen to what you say, realizing that you have the words of life and we can't do this on our own. God, you speak to us. Tell us what to do, and we'll do that. We'll be obedient. And as a builder who builds his house, we'll be digging deep and, and building on a firm foundation. We realize we can't do it without you. We come to you. We come to you. You're our everything, our all in all. May we not just be hearers today, but may we be doers as well. If we walk out of this place and forget what we've heard, and we're deceiving ourselves. But we want your truth to reside in our life and to be forefront in all that we do. We want to be your people who do what you say. God, I believe, believe that you're going to bring blessing beyond blessing to our lives as we walk in the path that you have for us. It might not be easy. It might be very difficult. But we don't want anything else. We just want you. We want your way. We want your truth. Help us to live lives that honor you and that make a difference in this world. We believe in you, Jesus. Forgive us of our sins, every person in this room. For those that are responding to you today, God, that you would confirm in their hearts 
what they've heard today, that your Holy Spirit would guide them and lead them and move in them. We pray in the name of Jesus, giving you thanks. And everybody said amen. amen. If you made a decision today for Jesus and you, uh, we, we want to know that. Let us know. We want to come alongside you and help you in this journey following Jesus. We're here together. We're all part of the same family. So excited for you making that decision. If you need help at any time, give us a call. Uh, call the church. Call one of the pastors. If you don't have our numbers, email us. Those are all on the website. I'll give you my number. My card's out there. Pastor Weaver's card's out there. Pick that up as you go out. Call us anytime. We want to be here to help.